Welcome to Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. Adrian Fries and Trey Bailey invite you to join them on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as we participate in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. This episode, we are pleased to welcome Jessica Hooten Wilson. Jessica Hooten Wilson is the author of three books Giving the Devil His Due, Flannery O'Connor and the Brothers Karmazov, which received a 2018 Christianity Today Book of the Year and Arts and Culture Award. In 2019, she received the Hyatt Prize for Humanities from the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture. She is a co editor of the volume Solzhenitsyn and American Culture. The Russian Soul in the West, a collection of essays on the legacy of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. She just published The Scandal of Holiness, Renewing Your Imagination in the Company of Literary Saints, and Learning the Good Life from the Great Hearts and Minds that Came Before. Jessica Hooten Wilson, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So yeah, it sounds like a lot more than three books. I might need to change my bio. <laughs> Well, perhaps so, and, and I would love for you to tell us your work. I first came across your work when I was first teaching American literature, and I was putting together a case to go before the administration to say, this is why we need to read Flannery O'Connor in Mr. Mm -hmm. Bailey's class. And your name kept popping up, and I found a great video, a short clip, where you talk about your love of Flannery O'Connor, and, and that did the trick. So we were mm -hmm. able to read a few of her stories and let me say that they shocked the students in all the right ways. Good. So I imagine we'll talk about Flannery O'Connor a bit. I'd like to start with a question that came to me while I was listening to one of your lectures that you gave at Union University. And this question may strike some of our listeners as a bit morbid. Mm. But the question is, what would you like, if anything, to be written on your tombstone? Mm. Yeah, so that's one of the questions I always turn on my students. And I've been debating this quite a bit, actually, because Thea Bowman, she was an educator's uh, African American nun um, in the mid 20th century. And she put on her tombstone, she tried, mm. which I think is just lovely. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab the book real quick. Hold on. Wait. <sighs> The other thing that I, <laughs> I'm actually like thinking through this um, because I, I want to make sure that, you know, I get it right. Um, at the end of Book of the Dun Cow, it says of Pertilote, she slept peacefully, right? So this idea that like she had been successful, it says she had been successful, she slept peacefully. Mm -hmm. I also like that idea. So she tried, she had been successful, something about um, the good and faithful servant that I hope to be. Right. But in a way that reminds people that it's a it's a call for all of us to be that good and faithful servant, because I just imagine people like walking by my tombstone. How can I still be a witness even after I'm gone? You know, like, what am I going to leave behind that um, is still going to tell people which direction is true north? You know, mm -hmm. I wonder, Adrian, have you ever thought about that question? When I heard when I heard it in the talk that Jessica gave, I thought about it myself. And uh, the first thing that came to my mind was something to the effect of. He did the dishes. <laughs> That's Which funny. Is, you know, for all my faults, I do I do the dishes. So, <laughs> so that is one thing. I like you it. No, I I don't know that I've ever I've ever thought of it. I really haven't. Um, we have a joke in our family, though. <laughs> you know, with four children and we homeschooled, there there was always something in the house that was burning. You know, somebody forgot <laughs> food. And so my husband would get home from work every day for a long time. He'd say, what's burning? <laughs> so the kids have all, we have this family joke that when, when Brian dies, they're going to cremate him and put him in the urn and on the urn, it's going to say, what's burning? <laughs> I, th I think if anything would scare people walking through a graveyard, it would be something like that and written on a tombstone. <laughs> Although I know now that we're Orthodox, we won't be cremated. So, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> but yeah, I haven't actually thought of it, but that's a good challenge. I will, I will think about that now. Yeah, it's a good memento mori just to kind of reflect on mm. what what is going to make it a good finish to the race, you know? Mm. Right. Yeah. So for our listeners who, who may not know, memento mori there in the Latin means... Remember your death. Right. Remember your death. So there's a great book by Muriel Spark, and a novel in which um, all these characters who are octogenarians, they receive these phone calls that says, remember, you will die. And so then the whole novel becomes a memento mori for the reader. But then also, how do people respond to remembering their death? Right. Right. When I was putting together things for my first classroom, and this will get to a lot of the questions that we see from our listeners about, you know, how should I decorate my classroom or how can mm -hmm. I, you know, what should I put in the space to kind of get to that, you know, what often has been referred to as the hidden curriculum, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, the things in the atmosphere and in the environment. And so I, I wanted it to be, you know, this, this place in which there would be weird little things like a memento mori. So I have this skull that sits on my desk and, you know, the students during that first year of the pandemic would put a mask on them and, <laughs> and of course, <laughs> He, uh, he received all sorts of compliments and nicknames and also some, some strange looks. <laughs> but now he resides in our home library on the mantle. And my three-year-old daughter uh, lovingly refers to him as Minto Mari. <laughs> that's his name, Minto. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> that's really cute. <laughs> well, well, what we'd like to do is uh, not just talk about death on this show. We'd like to talk about living a good life. Mm -hmm. And on the day that we're recording it here, it just happens to be St. Patrick's Day. And so it's appropriate that we talk about saints on this day. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're someone who thinks a lot about saints. And I just wonder why. Why is sainthood something that has captivated your imagination? Yeah, when I first started inquiring into the lives of saints, I was actually living abroad. I was living in Prague, and I was teaching at Charles University there. And if you don't know, the Czech Republic is the um, most atheist country in Europe. That's the way they refer to themselves. So I was teaching religion and literature there, which is my specialty. And I just remember being kind of struck by the fact that most of them realized I was American. A lot of my mannerisms or my behaviors or, you know, I smiled a lot. They thought I was very American, but not a single one of them taking my class thought, wow, she's Christian. Her whole life is different. She has something that all of us, you know, a room full of atheists don't have. And I realized, okay, what would I need to be doing and how would I be living that they could just see that they could realize that because I've, I've mostly been in these Christian environments where I didn't have to think about that question because I was always surrounded by like-minded and like-hearted people. And I've been at mostly Christian universities my whole time. So that question made me start investigating novels. That's my go-to usually for where I find truth. And what did these people look like who pursued holiness their whole life? And so I, I did, I started looking at sanctity and then I realized my Bible, the NIV didn't even use the word saint. It often just referred to the holy ones or the disciples or those called by God. But the call to sanctity is all through the scriptures. You know, if you actually look at the Latin and the Greek, like that's what God is calling us to, even from the old Testament, like be holy, be set apart, be different, be my people, be perfect as I am perfect. And so what does that, what does that mean for us? That call hasn't gone away. And if so, what does it look like in the 21st century? So that's one of the reasons that I, I looked at this when I wrote the book, The Scandal of Holiness. Mm -hmm. Well, on this, on this podcast, one of the things we try to think about when thinking about classical education and specifically classical Christian education, mm -hmm. we think, okay, well, what is education for? And it seems to me that from a Christian perspective, sanctity has to be right there at the top of the list, yeah. at least in terms of the school working in conjunction with the family and with the church. And before I forget, I, I'm glad I said the word family because I wanted to ask you, I just happened to be reading through a book on the family by Michael O'Brien. Oh, I yeah. I did not expect this at the least um, <laughs> because it's just interesting how, you know, uh, these things just pop up. 
And maybe if I hadn't been planning to interview you this week, I, I, it wouldn't have caught me off guard as it did. But you actually wrote the introduction to that book. Yeah, well, I actually sent the book to Josh. Joshua Wren runs Wise Blood Books. I sent it to Joshua. I was like, you have to republish this, man. This is awesome. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I sent it to Joshua. And then um, Joshua and Michael O'Brien became fast friends through the publication of that. And um, and so, yes, I agreed to to write the intro for that. But I'm, yeah, I'm a huge supporter of Michael O'Brien. Those are the kinds of novels I'm talking about. Those are the ones that really grip you. But going to this idea of, of sanctity in the classroom, too, um, and the family and everything, there are some schools who their motto becomes cultivating saints, right? That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And when I spoke at Circe last summer, um, I, I was one of the keynotes for their national event, and I spoke on the necessity of educating saints. Like, that's what our classrooms are meant to be. And what does that look like for teachers if we're trying to teach saints, right? We're trying to create saints in the classroom. Um, but I do believe that that's our job. I recently defined, I made up my own definition and I'm sure I stole from like millions of people somewhere, right? Cause like, we're just, all of us are these compilations of hundreds of books. <laughs> so I don't know exactly where all of the pieces of this came from. Um, but when I was trying to define this kind of education that would cultivate saints, I defined it as education in an apprenticeship to a tradition that leads towards a contemplative life. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah, I liked it a lot. <laughs> so I was like, this is, if, if I could just go around and constantly focus on this definition and parse it out for people and talk about this is what I think classical education is trying to do, right? Is that kind of education. Um, but I do believe it ends in a con contemplative life and contemplation, of course, the love of God, seeing everything through, through God's eyes. All of that is, is part and parcel of being a saint. Yeah, and entering into a, a rich life of prayer. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Pray, you know, um, George Bernano's book that ends with uh, the Diary of a Country Priest, where it says grace is everywhere. So this idea of, you know, we could be praying all the time. We're supposed to pray without ceasing. Right. A lot of what we do when we're contemplative is to see things in a way that's always moving us towards prayer. It's interacting, it's participating in the divine life, like that kind of, I mean, and you being Orthodox, right? That's the whole, that's the whole mode of the Orthodox is that the eternal is always happening. How can we um, look at our lives as though we're participating in that? How can we always be aware of that and be beholders of that, that enchanted reality? It's so true. And I, I'm a huge advocate for nature study for that reason. I, I really believe that nature study is critical and getting kids outside to contemplate the things they find, the things they discover, to talk about them, to wonder together, to question. Mm -hmm. All of that is going to naturally point you to that contemplative way of thinking, the habit of contemplation, I guess, Yeah, to call it that. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I really, that's a, a beautiful um, way to define and that. Thank you. Yeah. Hopkins says, um, these things I'll hear and but the beholder wanting. It's one of my favorite lines from Summer's Harvest. And so it's this idea that, you know, from the time you're little, can you teach children to be beholders? Yes. Right? Get them into that mode of beholding. That's right. And we have to join them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't lose it. Yeah, very much. I mean, I was just I was just at a dentist appointment. I know these are really small decisions, but I feel like when families hear that it's not a giant life change you're making to move towards this pursuit, it's really tiny stuff. Um, there was a TV screen on in the dentist lobby room while we're waiting on like my eight year old to get her dentist appointment. And then I have a four year old and a seven year old. I'm like, we're not going to sit in here. I'm not I'm just you're not going to handle that inane cartoon that I can't turn off. We're going to go sit on the sidewalk outside and we're going to play with sticker books. <laughs> That's what we're going to do because I'm not, I'm not going to let you guys be taken over just because culture infringes upon everything we do. Um, you know, trying to find ways to just set it, set apart, get out of that as much as you can. That's great. That's great. I used to do the same thing with my kids. Yeah, I, I can't, I still do it actually. <laughs> I still go outside and wait yeah. when I'm at a doctor's office. If there's things blaring, I will actually say to the waiting reception um the receptionist i'll say i'm gonna go wait outside so when you're ready you know i'll be out there <laughs> good, for, a good for you i can't i can't stand it I, w I will never forget we again we lived overseas for probably the first two years of my daughter's life and so when we came to america she was i don't know she's two or three and we went to a restaurant it had screens on in the restaurant and she's like 
how rude. Why do they have those on? You know, like how rude. She couldn't even believe that that was a thing because in Europe, you don't have TV screens in every restaurant the way you do in America. It's true. It's true. Oh, well, speaking of TV screens, that's going to take us straight into uh, one of the things I really want to talk to you about, which is this whole uh, this whole idea that we've come face to face with in classical education now um, with virtual reality and online schools that, you know, online schools really took off because of COVID mm -hmm. and were quite frankly necessary for that time. Um, but now a lot of uh, families are making the choice to continue with that model. And so these new emerging models in, in the classical movement are concerning to me. Um, I don't have, um, I'm okay with online models to an extent, depending mm -hmm. on the age and how long. The virtual reality school, I, I'm not really feeling like I can support. Um, but I really uh, wanted to talk to you about this because I stumbled on your article uh, on your, I guess it's your blog, Awakening from Digital Slumbers, which I love the title of that. And it's just a beautiful essay. And, and I immediately, when I finished watching it, went and watched the documentary that you mentioned called The Social mm -hmm. Dilemma, which I strongly recommend everybody listening should watch because it is very eye-opening mm -hmm. and a very important um, documentary to watch to understand where we are and where we're going and why we're going there, what's happening before any kind of decisions are made for what kind of school model you want your children to be in. I would say you need to watch The Social Dilemma. Mm -hmm. And so you, you quoted that, you walked through Thoreau and Chesterton as they all address our weaknesses as human beings and our fall into a deep slumber and the detriment of losing ourselves. So I wanted you to talk to us a little bit about how this great slumber is influenced by the digital world mm -hmm. and how it's affecting children. I know you um, do work with students at the K-5 level as well as at the college level, both. So I'd really like to hear your wisdom and experience with how you think this is influencing students today. Yeah, so I always sound a little bit crazy when I talk too much about anti-screens and because I, I hear a lot of pushback. I have a lot of, I have great friends in town who all watch tons of screens with their kids and they have iPads on road trips and um, all those things. And I, I'm not a Luddite. I'm not completely opposed. Um, I use them, but it's my last resort <laughs> a lot of times. Um, or I'm doing something purposeful with screens. I think we just have to... We have to be aware of how screens become our default, how screens take over even when we don't want them to. I think we've all had that feeling of like, you picked up your phone, you're like, why did I just, why did I pick up my phone? I didn't even mean to pick up my phone. I don't know that I needed to see anything on my phone, but it, it the habit is there. So when it comes to screens, I think we do. We have to protect against that default mode. I think we have to really question and discern when we're using them, how we're using them. Are we using them because we have a headache and we're sick? You know, are we using them because, um, you know, we, we need a babysitter while we're on a podcast interview? Um, are we, <laughs> you know, in what, in what ways are we using them and why? And when it comes to school, that should be, from my perspective, a protected zone of not having screens. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I agree with you completely. So even when we did quarantine, I remember there were all these schedules that went out in 2020 where it was like two hours of educational screen time in the morning and two hours of fun screen time in the afternoon, right? And then it was like iPad school in between. So your kid was like on a screen for six hours. I, I refused. I would do the 30 minute Zoom meeting with the teacher. That's fine. It's interactive. There's real people there. Um, I've even done like the Paideia Institute does Latin, but the professor like dresses up. He has them read parts back and forth where they're playing out roles in Julius Caesar. It's interactive. It's talkative. The screen is a medium for communicating with people. It's not a replacement or a substitute for people. And I think that's that's one of the, the things we have to watch out for too, is that it doesn't become a substitute for real interaction or real nature or real um, embodied things that we need. Like it cannot substitute for those things. Yeah, I agree. Okay. That was a lot probably. No, that, that was really, really good. Um, I'm also really concerned about the amount of time children are in front of screens because there's really no research. I'm sure there's probably a little bit of research, but I, I the idea of putting 
like I have a real deep experience with teaching phonics mm -hmm. and handwriting penmanship. You know what? You can't really teach a five, six or seven year old penmanship no. and phonics. Well, I mean, it would be kind of a slipshod way of teaching it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. develop a lot of bad habits and poor readers. Yeah. Uh, so I have a, I, I, I really feel strongly about this, especially for the K2, K3. Mm -hmm. um, just, uh, you know, and if, if they're going to be on an online school for K1, 2, maybe an hour, maybe two at the most, but definitely not teaching penmanship or reading. So the parents need to be involved. Yeah. So if a parent is going to choose this model for their little one, they need to figure out what areas they're going to do at home. Mm -hmm. that are necessary to do one-on-one -on -one with their little person right and I, I don't I'm, I'm worried and concerned about parents not being aware of how involved they need to be if they're choosing that model um, well and I think I, you know again I'm just these are a lot of thoughts <laughs> so so you know when I have these conversations it's so much like a conversation but then I, I feel like I've gone on record like making a stand like I'm not making a stand I'm, I'm, I'm thinking through this I think like everyone else is that we're trying to figure yes. these things out and do this well but the best way to go about it is in conversation and to be discerning and to not just make assumptions and make our choices based on that but when I imagine a lot of families turning to two incomes or two working families and you're you're just working a lot and you have given school over to somebody else to take charge of so it's not even part of the family and then you feel entitled like if there's any work brought home it's an inconvenience on the time that you have away from work and you don't want to work anymore with your kid and you don't want and I think that that kind of model or that method of somebody else does the schooling you know, all of it, all of it belongs to somebody else. And I have my job and my kids have their job and neither the two shall meet. I, I just, I get concerned. Um, I don't know how much you can actually be involved if that's the case or how much you can even complain or even know what is happening with your kids if you do that. You know, Jessica, that's a good point. And in fact, I think that would be a good distinct marker for how classical education is different than your progressive models of education, your mm -hmm. run-of-the-mill schools, um, classical education is in partnership with parents. That's one of the mm -hmm. mottos that a lot of classical schools have and, and should have. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think I think a lot of parents are wanting that, but they're just not sure how yeah. and what to do at home. And one of the reasons I want to do this podcast, I mean, there's many reasons, but one of them is to help parents. Yes. I want to help parents like with my newsletter and with, you know, some of the online sessions we offer and being able to say, here's some th things you can do with your ch child at home. Right. If you mm -hmm. are new to classical education, you're a full-time working parent. What are the necessary things that you do need to do at home so that you are in partnership with, with that school? Because I think that most parents really do want to be. Yeah, they absolutely. just don't know how. Well, and a lot of it is, is more simple than I think we imagine. There is the homework. There are sheets that you have to do or math sheets or things like that. But a lot of it is easier. A lot of it is sitting around a table and what you're doing at dinner is, okay, narrate for me what you learned today or recite what you're That's learning right. in school. It doesn't have to be something that you know all the answers to um, or ask your kids questions that you don't know the answer to and have a conversation with them just depending on the age level of, of where they are but it doesn't it doesn't have to be a complete and drastic life change when you do classical education um, it's just these small habits that replace the old ones i agree i agree and turning the television off while you're having dinner yeah yeah i mean i i would just say just get them out of the house like I, <laughs> we, we we have we bought a screen um almost a year ago i think in 2021 we bought a television screen for our upstairs loft area and i just remember my kids were jumping up and down because they were so excited about this and the guy selling it to us he's like are you guys amish i was like no i've just never bought a screen before <laughs> you know like it just wasn't it's not in the center place of our home i'm so i'm so nervous about what that means even metaphorically that so many people they have it in their bedroom. They have it in the center of their house. They have it on their refrigerators. I'm just, right. it's taking over. <laughs> Everybody needs to read Mike TV by Roe Dahl. That oh, poem. yes, it's yes. It's a great poem. <laughs> we had our fifth graders recited at recitation recently. It was so good. <laughs> it's a great poem. Yep. 
Trey, I, I can tell you're ready to chime in. I've loved just listening for the time being. I'm reminded of some of the things that one of my favorite thinkers and educators, John Sr., mm -hmm. said about television. If I recall correctly, he said, smash it. <laughs> and of course, later in life, you know, when students noticed that uh, him and his wife happened to have a television, uh, he said something to the effect of, you know, something about a sweet hypocrisy every once in a while. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I, I'm right with both of you in, in, at the very least, issuing a caution mm -hmm. and trying to be thoughtful about it, understanding that these things meet us when we are at our weakest, right? When we are most mm -hmm. tired, when we are most exhausted, caught up in this totality of work, mm -hmm. uh, lacking leisure. And of course, homework is just the extension of schoolwork. And I've, I've been thinking a lot about this over the last few years. And I just think it's such an odd thing that we've gone from school A to school A off school A, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, schoolwork, uh, what, what a strange misnomer. Mm -hmm. And then to send it home, uh, I would hope that teachers, especially classical Christian teachers, would be very thoughtful about what they are asking parents to do with their children. Mm -hmm. It's likely that the life of the home requires that the children should be doing chores or something mm -hmm. that actually contributes to the life of the family and let, let school stay at school for the time being. I think they'd be okay uh, <laughs> if, if, if that happened. But I want us to get back to this idea of, of the saints because I can imagine that although many of the canonized saints, anyhow, uh, didn't have to deal with screens, they dealt with the same reality of the human condition mm -hmm. and the temptation and i would imagine that they would try to encourage people to get back in touch with reality itself and this idea of virtual reality would probably strike them as as very strange if not satanic perhaps and maybe mm -hmm. i'm maybe i'm going a bit too far jessica you help me out Oh, no. I mean, my first book is on demons. So, <laughs> you know, you're, you're speaking my language. <laughs> uh, my, you know, my, my first book was all about, we have this misunderstanding about what the demonic is, but the demonic really, I mean, I'm, I'm very orthodox in this. I'm very Dostoevskyan in this, right? Like it is a contagion. It is something that when you participate in it, it increases its power and it spreads and um, it must be exercised and replaced. So when we talk about screens, it's not enough just to turn them off and smash them. You replace them with positive things like prayer, nature walks, reading great books, being with family, going to church more often. Um, you just replace it with creating this, but it was parasitic, right? You were losing. And that's where you would see the demonic. If we want to change terms and make it um, less frightening for people, a lot of those things are parasites on you. You think that you're experiencing leisure. What you're actually doing is sucking your energy away, sucking your brain space away um, with just mindless content. And it's stealing energy from you. And it's actually causing more despair in our country than, than giving joy. But if you replaced those activities with some of the ones that the saints pursued, uh, such as prayer, such as friendship and um, service and gardening. I mean, there's so many things that as human beings, we have an opportunity to do that we should be filling our days with and, and then being able to see our days correctly numbered the way that they are. We were not meant to just entertain ourselves to death. I mean, I, I have to actually, most of my parenting, I think is you were not meant to be entertained. Like you were, you were not meant to be entertained. Like that's not your life. That's not my life. That's not my job. Um, to entertain you and make sure you're constantly entertained because I feel like most of the culture is teaching that like pleasure seeking entertainment instead of a life worth living <laughs> that is full of all these other good things. Mm -hmm. The word that I think of that's related to entertainment is amusement. Mm -hmm. And of course, notably that word, you know, when you put the A on the front of the word there, mm -hmm. without, without the without muse, the, oh, wow. <laughs> there it is. Yep. And especially for educators and parents who are interested in pursuing a, a classical Christian education, they should think very carefully about removing the muse or mm -hmm. uh, how, how should we think about muses, uh, Adrian? You, you've put some thought into this. Oh, Trey, I'm not really sure actually how to answer that. 
I have put a lot of thought into it, but I'm not ready to answer it on the spot. <laughs> yeah. I'm less of a perfectionist than Adrian on this one. So I, I can just externally process on for you and you can just correct whatever I say. Yeah. Um, well, for me, I've noticed that a lot of entertainment, so a lot of just films and TV shows, they're all riffing on the past. If I try to find a cartoon for my kids, it's all like Magic School Bus 2.0, Inspector Gadget 2.0, like no new things that are worthwhile are coming out. It's, it's regularly redone content. And one of the reasons that I think that that's true is because we don't have innovative creative spirits the way we did because those people don't have space in their life for creativity mm -hmm. and they're exploiting the nostalgia we feel to make money off of us and keep us consuming without putting in the hard work of making something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So what, what parents don't understand is that without that space for contemplation and creativity, right? their children aren't the innovators that they could be. They're actually losing the imagination that, that they're born with. Yeah, I mean, and when I think of the muses, the nine muses, I think of a very playful, imaginative, creative spirit happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the illustrations of the muses, you can look them up. They're dancing, they're joyful, they're surrendered, mm -hmm. you know, to mm -hmm. a beauty and a wonder. And so that's why I think even uh, with... Um, uh, in in the republic talking about the musical education is very much part of dancing with the muses really yeah you know, giving well, I, giving time for the playfulness and the contemplativeness of mm -hmm. being a human being and in, in awakening to the beauty and wonder around us because there's a lot there's a lot of beauty in this world that we yeah. miss when we're staring at a screen right Right. The freedom, the things that you can't quantify. We have just become such quantifiers. We forget all the quality. And I was thinking um, earlier when I gave that definition, education is the apprenticeship to the tradition. So part of that memory is the mother of muses. And so if you don't have that tradition, if you don't have a remembering as part of your moral responsibility, then you're not going to have the creativity to keep that tradition alive and move forward. That's right. And memory, remembering, I'm glad you brought that up, is a really important part in, in becoming a saint. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many things. I have a presentation I did for um, Angelina Stanford and Cindy Rollins on their back to school conference a few years ago on memory. And I took the time in preparing for that, looking up all of the ways in the scripture that the, the Lord tells us to remember and what are the things we do. Mm -hmm. What yeah. are the things we do to help us remember? Yes, yeah. And it's really, really, really important. It's it's not something to be taken lightly. So I believe that approaching memory and activities that encourage memory in education are very important for yes. all ages, K through 12. And there are many things pedagogically we can do to help students to develop a beautiful mind and a, and a memory it's divide it's it's definitely tied to sainthood for sure um yeah. so i'm really glad you brought that up that was that was a good point thank you well it's also tied to the body so we're talking about how to go against the screens which turned us into these you know binary gnostic like we are spirits right without the body remembering the members like it is a it is an embodied activity so a lot of what the saints did in the monasteries is they're chewing on the words they're orally hearing the words of the scripture right. they're walking and chanting through the churches in a certain order the 12 stations of the cross like everything was an embodied process of remembering and so what we're reclaiming in classical education is that memory and embodiedness go together and and that's what keeps it alive it becomes a real presence in us i mean it's very it's very eucharistic you know it becomes a real presence that we then go out and embody and body forth in the world true i'm, I'm glad you said that because how right it is that christ would say in regards to the eucharist do this in remembrance mm -hmm. of me Right. Of course, this is not merely some sort of you know, mental uh, exercise, yeah. or exercise, but rather, you know, like you said, a, a presence there, and we are in so participating in it, membered ourselves. We are. What mm -hmm. am I trying to say here? We become a part of a membership, as it yeah, were. Yeah, we do. Use a, yeah. a, a a word that will get all of our Wendell Berry fans uh, yeah. <laughs> excited here. 
<laughs> so let's let's go right back then, if we can, to virtual reality. I don't mm -hmm. want to lose the thread there because Adrian, you told me a story recently about attending a conference for educators, and if I remember correctly, it was for classical Christian educators, in which there was a presentation that was pushing pretty hard. Maybe it was a table that was set up. This idea that these schools should adopt virtual reality in the classroom and in the home as maybe a replacement for other forms of, of education. Yeah, I'll tell you the argument that I've that I heard um, that that the 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 lady um, shared with us, and I can confirm that argument because uh, there was a mom who commented in our Facebook group when we were having this discussion said the same thing that a lot of the parents who are wanting the virtual reality model i hear their frustration they're frustrated because they want their child to go to a classical school but the only classical school that they can find is an hour drive away so they're driving two hours a day and they're feeling like they're losing family time and they want something they can do at home that's classical and the other statement that was concerning to me was that, oh, well, we're going to give this classical curriculum content through wearing these goggles on their faces and take them to Rome, you know, virtually and, and give them this beautiful content that's the same content that's being used in a lot of other charter schools. Um, and yet I think that understanding that Content isn't the only thing that makes the education classical is missing. Mm -hmm. the, a huge part of what makes a classical education classical is the relationships and the atmosphere mm -hmm. from mind to mind, from person to person interacting. Um, they claim that the students are gonna be able to interact virtually at like desks sitting next to each other virtually but they're going to be seeing themselves as cartoons on the screen, you know, yeah, and, then, <laughs> and then this, this whole idea that I, Trey found there is, it, it's a virtual vrchurch.org or vrchurch.com. And they are actually doing virtual baptisms. The entire pastor staff, the pastoral staff has their, you know, on their website, their faces, they give their bio of their, you know, pastoral ministry and the reason for wanting to, to uh, switch to this VR church model, but they all have avatars. And so when they're doing the baptisms, they're doing them as their avatars. And I, one of the people in the, uh, at this conference, he raised his hand and he brought up, I'm so glad he did, because you brought it up, I think on our Facebook group and so did others, Plato's case. And I thought, wow, yeah, that's the, pretty perfect analogy for this and and so one of you i'd like one of you to share with our listeners because not everybody here knows what plato's cave is and knows the reference so here tell us what tell us about plato's cave why don't you tell us jessica well is this a comment that trey actually made yeah not he made the, the comment looking at <laughs> plato's cave so like I'm just, yeah, go ahead and share share i mean we just want to tell our listeners what plato's cave is basically so and then how it relates so Plato's cave is that you're chained inside and you're watching shadows and the shadows are actually the real things that are happening behind you that are being cast. And then one person gets free and discovers that outside the cave, the people are really living and you have only been living through shadows this whole time. And so of course the person runs back into the cave and is like, look, there's actually the real people there, not just the shadow life that's happening and they don't want to hear it. They'd rather stay and live in the shadows, right? Right. Um, and, and Lewis, C.S. Lewis uses this image when he talks about the shadow lands that all of us are inhabiting this in shadowed place, right? Where we're all trying, we're all existing according to the shadows and because we've all put first things second rather than second, you know, first things first. Um, and thus we've missed on the reality of the first things, which is the embodied existence. I mean, that's, we should be able to smell reality and taste it and feel it and, um, instead, we've given that away only for the sake of plot or content or skills based. And, and we've missed the whole process, which is what education actually is. It's, it's relational. It's in progress. It's a pilgrimage. It's in process. It's embodied. I mean, all those things, those people that are driving forever, you would just be so much better off to buy a dozen books a year and have your kids just read and talk about them. I mean, that's really true. <laughs> that would be a thousand times better. <laughs> right. So just homeschool them. 
yeah. homeschool them and read books and go outside and do nature studies and enjoy mm-hmm. your children and don't be so worried about the checklist of all the things that you think that you have to do with them that yeah. make it a classical school because yeah the mm-hmm. love of learning and the love of beauty and the experience with these the beautiful rich literature and music that you can turn on in your home and yep. do in your home is is priceless it's yeah right. it's way better I think that's all precisely right. And I I want to address the concerns perhaps of a mother who's thinking, well, if only I could, if only I had the time or the resources or the help really is what it often comes down to. And I've thought about this a lot. Jessica and I were chatting before the show about how we're both in uh, what I've heard referred to as the Valley of Diapers. (laughs) Maybe you're coming out of it uh, with with your youngest there, but you know, especially people with young children, there's, there's such a need for help there. And what a great opportunity for people to step in. I want to think, I can't remember who this was, but if, if we think back to the depiction of the final judgment in which Christ, perhaps this is in all of the synoptic gospels, asked those questions related to feeding the hungry, uh, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and imprisoned, I mean, God has given us in our children those very people, right? He's, they come out naked, if I remember correctly, and they desperately need to be clothed and fed, very hungry. Mm-hmm. And they get sick and need tending to. They're going to be imprisoned by sin, all the various things in life that are looking to, to trap them and entangle them. And so even in our children, we have the means by which we can work out our salvation with fear and trembling as it were. And so for those without children, it seems that, you know, there are people with children nearby that need your help and need you to be a spiritual mother or a spiritual father. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about this just the other day. I mean, we're having a quite the crisis in our country related to childcare. Mm-hmm. It's exorbitantly expensive. And, you know, you would think that a civilized society would have figured this out by now, but, but we haven't. And so I'm just going to go ahead and turn it back on myself and turn it back on my fellow Christians sitting in the pews to say, if your church has a family that needs child care, well, there's, there's your sign, right? Uh, there's the ministry. If you have a, uh, a single mother who's having to work two jobs, right, to, to provide for family, I mean, you know, when the scripture talks about ministering to the widows and orphans, it's not... It's not merely talking about those who have lost their husbands and have been, you know, have lost their parents. I mean, people are are orphaned by all sorts of systems, or widowed by all sorts of it's true all sorts of systems. And so, uh, I don't mean to preach, but it's true. It's true. To bring this back to the question of education. I think that it likely requires a a few conversations, maybe more, with friends and family to say, "Look, this is what I want for my children, and I need your help." To make it happen. I think that that's great that you say that. And it's one thing in my church that I've been thinking a lot about. I've been volunteering and helping at our church homeschool co-op. And everybody that's helping with the co-op has a child in the co-op. I'm the only one there that doesn't. And I think to myself, well, my kids are grown. I have time to come in mm-hmm. and read with these children. And I, I hope that my doing that will help inspire some of the other older women in the church to do the same because they're all valuable women and have something they could give by coming and helping. And I, I think that's great that you said that, Trey. You didn't even realize that that was something on my heart. But mm-hmm. yes, I think, I think you're absolutely right that us older women really need to be thinking about how we can help the younger women. I think that's a, it's something that we've lost in the church. Mm-hmm. And we need to reclaim that because it's it's scriptural for the older women to come in and help the younger. Yeah. And I, I don't see it happening a lot as much uh, as it should. Again, again, with the screens, I mean, I just, I have a lot of retired friends and that's what they end up doing. Mm-hmm. They, they, they sit at home and watch shows and true. We, we need them and they're not there because they're like, yeah. I've done my part, checked my boxes, <laughs> like... <laughs> Or they, or, right, right. Some of it, Jessica, though, too, is I think that they aren't really sure 
there's a lot of dear, wonderful older women in my church, but I think they almost feel like they're not sure how they could help. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really feeling isolated and not really sure that their their help is wanted or needed. Right. right? right. So this is the call. This is the call. And I this and some, call, of them, right. <laughs> some of them are, are, are super fantastic. Like one of my, well, maybe two of my heroes at my church are these retired women that are Sunday school leaders and Bible school teachers. And they're just like, they're on it. You know, yeah, <laughs> they yeah. just need to rally the troops um, to, to get everybody together. Cause there are the church body. It should be a lifelong thing, right? That all of us are a part of from the time we're in the Valley of the diapers all the way through we're in the diapers again, you know, like it should be a right. lifelong deal. It's true. I'm in the diapers again with my grandchildren yeah yeah <laughs> it's great well we're getting close to needing to wrap up but I, w I want to before we ask you our concluding question I would like you to tell us a little bit about your new book yeah yeah I, you know we've mentioned a couple times with this idea of sanctity um so I've got two books coming out one in March and one in May and the one in March is really focused on the church and it's really it's very much focused on um, holiness. And I know it's actually been purchased by some um, Catholic schools uh, in different cities where they're, they're giving it to their teachers and asking their, their teachers to kind of walk through these chapters that are about what it means to be holy, right? Um, the contemplative life, how to, to face suffering, how to have memento mori as part of your spiritual disciplines and your practices, um, how to really view motherhood and what that looks like in relationship to God and just some of these big questions that I think don't get answered by secular literature. And so the scandal of holiness is looking at those. It's trying to renew our imaginations. It's really seeing our imagination as just as vital to our Christian walk as our minds and as our will. And that all three of those things are, are playing a role in how we act and how we move towards the divine life. And, um, so that's the scandal of holiness. The other one, the reason I want to mention it, especially with classical education, is the second one that comes out in May is called Learning the Good Life. And it's a collection of excerpts from the great texts across the tradition. And it's a very inclusive reader. It has Eastern and Western tradition in it. Um, it's also got uh, voices such as, you know, Frederick Douglass and Jarena Lee and um, has Wendell Berry, which you mentioned earlier, Trey. So it goes all the way up to contemporary, but all the way back to Seneca and Plato and um, so it's a way of getting parents involved. It's giving a resource for parents to say, let's read an excerpt together aloud at the table. There's an introduction, so I don't have to feel completely lost. And here's discussion questions we can ask as a family. Um, oh, that's and, lovely. And, so, yeah, so that's a really good parent resource. I think I'm hoping all classical education, like all schools and homeschools, just kind of start adopting that as a, as a text that's a really good resource for them. I just saw a need. And, and hope to yeah, this that sounds it. like it's a lot more approachable than the wonderful giant book by Richard Gamble, The Great Tradition. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is, is a really good book. Yes, and it's got lots of wonderful essays that walk mm -hmm. you from the ancient to the present. Um, wonderful, but what you're saying sounds a lot more approachable for parents, I think, and teachers. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. It's supposed to be, and it's just it's a it's a lot smaller in its format. So mm -hmm. great. Well, if our listeners are looking for a book to read, I recommend that they look for an author with saint in front of his or her name. <laughs> and if you've got enough of those on your shelf to keep you busy, then pick up something by Jessica Hooten Wilson as well. <laughs> and I think you'll be delighted to find uh, just as many thoughtful and witty and endearing uh, comments there as you have in this interview. Our final question is also related to books, and that is, let's see, I think I want to make this kind of unique to our conversation here. I wonder, is there a book that you wish you had read earlier in your life as a mother? Hmm. As a mother, specifically. So I, I read Kristen Lovren's Daughter when I was in my 20s, but at the time I was enthralled with the romance part of that book. And so I did love it, but the motherhood part didn't sink in. And it wasn't until reading it as a mother that that started to sink in. And so her way of lifting up motherhood to become an epic spiritual battle was amazing. Um, it's this huge novel, but really what 
is, you know, really being garnered there is this look at the mother's heart, also the wife's heart, right? Like towards her husband and the choice that she made. And she, you know, lives with someone that she fell in love with, but then also has to practice loving for years and years and years. And her children are both what she loves and she gives herself to, but then they become their own people and those relationships change. And all of that is her sanctification. It's sanctification through these ordinary relationships that take on spiritual urgency, spiritual reality. And uh, so I, I love that novel. It's probably one of my top 10 favorite novels. You know, and I haven't read it, but everybody tells me. Uh -huh. and, I, and I just like two days ago, I thought I have to read that this year. It's going on my list. So after I read it, let's get you back on and you and I can talk about it, about yeah. you know, how it relates to our life as women. I think that would be a wonderful, maybe we can well, have a couple other women and we can Yes. Have a really yeah. beautiful woman conversation <laughs> seminar. Yeah. Well, well read moms just they're assigning it. So if you wanted a reader's group, they're assigning it for April, May, and June, maybe, or May, June, July as their summer as their read. So you could listen to their podcast with them as they walk through the book oh, and they have great. like a little study guide with the book. And okay, we can put that on the show notes. Yeah, well read moms. So it's a really and this is the centenary for Kristen Lavern's daughter because she writ she wrote it 1920 through 1922 because it's three volumes. So wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jessica. This Absolutely. was really wonderful. We really appreciate all the work you're doing and I'm sure we're going to have you on the show again. Okay. Well, absolutely. I, I love supporting classical education. I'm really thrilled with what you guys are doing. So thanks. Yep. Thank you so much for listening. We invite you to experience the art of teaching through interactive learning communities at our Patreon page. Visit patreon.com forward slash classical education. Also, be sure to join the conversation on our Facebook community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. We are a listener supported podcast, so your support makes this podcast possible. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once wrote, well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be in a few words this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know best of all what it is to behave under it as in the presence of a father who is in heaven. <laughs>